Hello everybody, welcome to KBC's Daily Vlog, a Bible study looking through Isaiah, and today we're in chapter 30, verses 15 to 18. Firstly, the context, uh, Judah's under threat from Assyria, and instead of trusting in God, they are, uh, as they are being urged to do by the prophet, of course, they're looking towards Egypt in the south, and Isaiah the prophet is warning them not to do this. And by the way, that's a kind of a theme in the Bible, that um, a warning not to look south or go south or return to Egypt. Um, because Egypt, among other things, is a symbol for uh, returning to the old ways of slavery. And of course, that's a position that God has redeemed us from. Um, us figuratively, you know, we're redeemed from a, a life of slavery to, to sin and to self and to, to the old law. Um, and they, of course, were, had, were slaves in Egypt. But there's uh, times when Christians do go south, as it were, um, in returning to their old lifestyle. Apologies for the computer, it's getting a bit noisy with the old fan, but um, I'm sure you can hear me above that. Um, so it, in a way, these passages remind us really of the, that story, the parable of the prodigal son, because they, they use the same, same sort of language. The prodigal son, of course, the wasteful son, rebellious son, left the father's house uh, to, to go his own way, to go wayward. And uh, he had to learn the hard way that actually it was much better in the father's house where he returns to at the end. And our verses today really take us on a similar journey. So let's just read them. There's only uh, a short passage so we can get through them quite quickly. Verse 15. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none, none of it. You said, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. You said, we will ride off on swift horses, therefore your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one, and the threat of five you will all flee away, till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountain top or a banner on a hill. That was an old way of communicating to one another um, by putting banners on hills, wasn't it? So I suppose what he's saying is, you know, it's going to be open to all, you're going to be able to see it. The Lord longs to be gracious to you, this is verse 18, Therefore he will rise up to show you compassion, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. So right at the very start of this passage, God reminds the people where their salvation is and where their strength is. It's in rest and trust in God, in the safety of the, the house of God, if you like, the grace house. Um, and the grace house, it's not a place of turmoil, it's a quiet place, it's a restful place. It's, this is the imagery we've got. And when I think of um, my mum and dad's house, where I grew up, of course, uh, there was a lovely uh, atmosphere of calm. And when I used to go back with the kids, there was always this lovely, restful, peaceful atmosphere there. Um, and people were attracted. There were always guests coming and going. Um, why? Because you were accepted just as you are, just as you were. And it, your only motivation was to be there with them. And it was a lovely place to be. And, and God's place is like that. He says, look, just stay with me. This place of rest, this place of strength and uh, benefit for all that I am and all that I will give you. But it, and all that is, is said before they've even gone to Egypt. They, they are reminded with the words in repentance and rest is your salvation. Quietness and trust is your strength right at the start. So it's also a reminder, when it all goes pear-shaped, I'll still be here in the grace house. That's amazing, isn't it? It's as if at the start of the prodigal, uh, prodigal son's journey, the father tells him where to return to. Remember to come back to repentance and rest. But you said, no, we'll flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. Because Judah rejected God's promise and trusted in horses, what are we trusting in? And other such things. Uh, they would need to flee. But if they'd have just trusted in God's promise, trusted in God's word, they would have no reason to flee. And they would have seen the Lord's salvation and strength instead. And the irony is that it actually takes a lot more effort, doesn't it, to um, to carry off a proper rebellion. I mean, the, the prodigal son had to travel a great distance. It was a great distance to travel to Egypt. They'd have had to get delegation, um, to get some riches, perhaps to make an alliance takes a lot more effort. Someone once said that rebellions consumes and obedience produces. <laughs> if you're really going to uh, go your own way, sometimes it takes more out of you than you realise. I think it's the easiest course 
to go your own way as, as the prodigal son found out he ends up in the pigsty broke one thousand shall flee at the threat of one this is a reversal of the promise found in leviticus 26 verse 8 five of you will chase a hundred and a hundred of you will chase ten ten thousand it's a it's a kind of reversal of that promise isn't it and a fulfillment of the curse that's outlined in Leviticus 26, 17, for disobedience. But verse 18 is a lovely verse, isn't it? It says that the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. Listen to that same verse in the Amplified that really digs out all the meanings in the words in the original. And therefore, the Lord earnestly waits, expecting and looking and longing to be gracious to you. And therefore, he lifts himself up that he may have mercy on you and show loving kindness to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied are all those who earnestly <clears throat> wait for him, who expect and look and long for him, for his victory, for his favour, his love, his peace, his joy, his matchless, unbroken companionship. <laughs> it, it, in the Amplified, you really get a sense of the picture of the prodigal son's story, don't you? With the father waiting, longing to, to see the son return. And then when he sees him, he rises up and he runs to him. And there's that urge, look, why don't we do the same? Why, why don't we wait for the Lord to earnestly seek him and to look for all the lovely things that are in his house, in the grace house? And then it says this fascinating thing that, it says that God is also not just a God of mercy, but a God of justice. And on the surface, mercy and justice seem irreconcilable, don't they? If you're in a, in a courtroom and a criminal's before the judge, you think, well, he's either going to get mercy or justice. And you can't, surely you can't have both. But in God's economy, you can have both at the same time. And this, of course, was shown ultimately at the cross, where Jesus took all our punishment that we deserved uh, on himself so that God's justice could be satisfied. But at the same time, God shows mercy by extending the work of Jesus Christ as payment for our sins. And only God can do this. Mercy and justice reconcile. That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Romans 3.26 And I love the way that the Amplified rounds that up at the end of the verse. Blessed are those who earnestly wait for him, who expect and look and long for him. For his victory, his favour, his love, his peace, his joy, his matchless, unbroken companionship. What a great place to be in the presence of God. So if you seek for him, you, you wait for him, you're rewarded by knowing him personally. Pretty awesome. Huh? Words spoken so many years ago, hundreds of years ago, are still relevant to us today and speaking to our lives today. And I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. God bless. Have a great day. Bye for now.